suspect you're, most of you are like me, and you start having these doubts crowd in, anxieties. You have trouble living in daytight compartments, as William Oster put it, having a list of things to do. And I came across a poem in a British humor magazine, Punch. And I, kept it, I cut this poem out and, and kept it uh, over my desk for many, many years. But the poem is really to take it on deep, which is almost, say, theological significance for me. And the poem uh, was, uh, it resonated with me particularly because when I went off to college, I thought I would be a geologist. And this is a poem obviously written about somebody who was a geologist or a mineralogist. And it goes as follows. The title of the poem is The Judgment. <clears throat> I dreamed the angels came for me at night. They stood about my bed, severe of mien, and asked one question. What is instatite? It is an orthorhombic pyroxene, I said, and as I spoke, I heard the jangle of planets crashing down the cosmic seas. I added hastily, its, it's cleavage angle is 87 more or less degrees. If it were 56, not 87... It would quite clearly be an amphibole. In this they led me singing up to heaven, where angel hands received my battered soul. Well, that's the poem. Uh, it's a, you might say it's kind of a quirky poem, but it grabbed me because the significance of that poem to me was that at least in the, the portion of your life in which you allow others to pay you for what you, you do, there's really no substitute for competence and knowing things, so that whatever this guy's battered life might have been, et cetera, et cetera, he was ultimately held accountable for being good at what he was paid to do, and that is to know about all these minerals, et cetera, et cetera. So they asked one random question, and that was it. And I'd like to think that of the stuff that we're teaching you, and the problem with all this stuff is that everybody thinks their topic is the most important, right? And there's a lot of stuff that you're never going to encounter in life, and the other problem is that half of it's going to be shown wrong. <laughs> but the problem is there are going to be over and over and over again critical moments in your life in which you really are held accountable for knowing things. This morning I just ran over here from a hospital where I saw two patients. One was a fellow I know who uh, had a, 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 what looked like a very atypical case of cellulitis on his leg, and he'd also come in with some chest pain, and the question was, was I missing something? Was this some syndrome that I ought to know? And I wrote a, a textbook of infectious diseases for primary care, and I think I know all about cellulitis, but I'm really going to have to scratch my brain to see if I might be missing something there. The other was a person with methicillin-resistant staph RAS and having a, a reaction to drugs and so on and so forth. And so, again, you just always have to kind of check on these things and I realize that in these handouts that you have, uh, there's a lot of information there, but focus particularly on the stuff that I put in bold, because that's the stuff that I think you need to know and carry home, and that's the stuff that will be emphasized on the exams. So I won't, uh, what is Institute will not be on your exam, but again, there's just no, no substitute for uh, knowing a lot of these things, and fortunately, you're not going to have to know it all. You'll eventually... Uh, go into one another area of medicine and hang out a shingle that, hey, this is what I'm competent at. But there are certain things that you need to know to be a doctor. Infectious diarrhea. It's a fairly straightforward lecture today, uh, somewhat of a confusing lecture for me to give and for you to take because you have to think of it in terms of, again, both the syndromes and also the uh, pathogens. Worldwide, uh, the single greatest cause of morbidity and mortality, mainly because of the little children in developing countries dying of diarrhea. And what are some of the things that they die from with diarrhea? Excuse me? Dehydration. What are the pathogens that get them? Cholera in a lot of places. What else? E. coli, Shigella particularly. We'll talk about Shigella. Very decisive uh, role in world history. A lot of the great battles in history have been decided by diarrhea, perhaps dating back to the plague of the Philistines in the Hebrew Bible that some people feel was due to shigellosis, and that the emeroids that the Philistines made were uh, hemorrhoids. If you get diarrhea in the tropics, you get hemorrhoids. Uh, 
South might have lost the Civil War because Lee had diarrhea at Gettysburg, it is suggested. Third most common syndrome seen in general practice in the United States. So it is common. And one thing to talk about that's not going to be in my exam is the things that keep you from getting diarrhea and infections. One to emphasize here is the gastric acidity. Antacids uh, and H2 blockers, proton pump inhibitors, things that ablate the uh, normal gastric acid barrier, uh, dramatically reduce the dose of various pathogens required to cause diarrhea, especially in salmonella, et cetera, et cetera. So this is something to know about. The intestinal microflora are crucially important, particularly in what syndrome, that, by way of review, what anaerobic pathogen causes diarrhea. We'll talk about this Clostridium difficile, major cause of hospital-acquired diarrhea. And as we shall see, it's a common colonizer of the bowel uh, that is brought out when you suppress the flora with all these broad-spectrum antibiotics that we have. We'll talk about doses of uh, enteric pathogens a little bit. The point to make here for take-home points is that Shigella is highly infectious, Shigellosis. It might need only 10 to 100 cells to cause infection, Shigella, so hand-to-hand -hand transmission of Shigella. Where are you going to pick up giardiasis? Anybody? In the woods, that's good thought there. What? Yeah, good, good. Classically, you're going to go camping in the Rocky Mountains, right, on vacation, and you drink that clear water that tastes so good from cool mountain spring, and lo and behold, it's got giardia in it. Giardia, only about 100. Amoebiasis, so two pathogens. Beyond that, salmonella, all this a little bit controversial. E. coli takes a lot of contamination. Salmonella, usually, something's got to sit out on the counter for a while. Cholera takes a huge slug of, of stuff. Cholera does. Uh, almost as much. If, if you put bacteria in a, uh, in a, in a broth tube, what will they grow up to? Ten to the what? Remember the bacterial growth curve that you had? You got the lag phase, the log phase, the stationary phase, and the climb. What, is, what do they grow up to? Ten to the nine. It takes about 10 to the 6 for a fluid to be cloudy on the basis of bacterial growth alone, which becomes an important point uh, in, in some settings. So that's about as, but remember that about a third of the people in the world drink water in their bottles, and we probably see some bottles of water sitting around here, right? About a third of you. About a third have clean water, and a third uh, have to drink very contaminated water. When I was a medical student uh, back in the dark, dark ages, there were only a few uh, pathogens that caused diarrhea. And uh, in my lifetime, professionally, uh, all of these have been added. So the list of things that cause diarrhea is, is uh, quite uh, extensive. Uh, and the same is true for viruses. We just talked about viral diarrhea. Now there are lots of viruses that do it which the most important ones that we'll talk about later are the rotaviruses and the Norwalk agent. And parasites have really exploded. We knew only about amoebiasis and giardiasis. And now, particularly with the HIV AIDS epidemic, lots of others have come into play. So we're going to talk about all of those. One way to look at diarrhea is low volume versus high volume diarrhea. And the more relevant slide is this one. Two syndromes of diarrhea that you will find useful in, in practice, uh, differentiating between the squirts and the runs. <laughs> and I like to ask patients this all the time. Uh, the runs where you uh, are doing fine, and uh, all of a sudden you just got to go. And you go and you have this huge, rushing, watery bowel movement. How many of you had that? And I want to ask, might, might embarrass us. Uh, but the runs are small bowel diarrhea. The colon is acting normally. The colon is a reservoir, right? You can live without your colon. We can do a total colectomy and you'll do fine with your little ileostomy bag or whatever, you know? Uh, the the uh, colon is a, is a reservoir. 
So it's, it's working normal. And there's no pain uh, on defecation. Blood and white cells are rare. Proctoscopy is normal, and the pain is mostly mid-abdominal. When your small bowel hurts, the pain is around the umbilicus. Large bowel diarrhea is a squirts. Here the, the colon is diseased. So you go frequently. It hurts to go, and uh, you have a small stool, uh, which may be, there may be pain or defecation. You may see blood and white cells in the stool. Proctoscopy will be abnormal, and the pain will tend to be over the sigmoid colon in the left lower quadrant. Which of these two conditions is more serious? Well, both of them can be life-threatening. Small bowel diarrhea, the, uh, the runs would be typical of classic for cholera. You die from dehydration and cholera, as somebody suggested. Uh, I mean, it is an incredible outpouring of fluids. In fact, so bad that, uh, you know, they have these cholera cots, and they could have a hole in the center that you would just lie in down on this cot so you could just kind of run out the bottom there because you're too weak to get up. Uh, large bowel diarrhea, uh, in, with the syndromes that we see, though, is more apt to portend a, uh, a, a, bad, a, a bad illness. These are uh, leukocytes in the stool stained with methylene blue. And usually uh, when you see leukocytes in the stool, white blood cells in the stool, that indicates uh, certain conditions and uh, the various uh, infectious causes that do it. Uh, we're talking mainly about the squirts. It doesn't have to be an infection. Ulcerative colitis, ischemic colitis can do it. Shigella. Shigellosis, enteroinvasive E. coli, including the famous E. coli of uh, 0157, C. diff, Clostridium difficile, sometimes Salmonella and other syndromes less common, but these are the major ones that we think about. Fecal leukocytes, so that's, that's big, fecal leukocytes. Fecal leukocytes indicate either colonic diarrhea, it may be mononuclear here, interestingly enough, or it could be an, uh, an inflammatory bowel disease. The thicker leukocytes are big. And then one way to look at another way, yet another way to look at diarrhea is by the mechanisms of uh, syndromes that you get related to the gut. Uh, and there are several. Uh, toxin production, as in food poisoning, which we'll say a little bit about that and nothing on the exam for me, Enteroadherence, in which things simply stick onto the mucosa, and this is mainly with the small bowel, things like giardia and cryptosporidia. You just see these little things. I mean, they're literally little suckers sticking on the mucosa, and we'll show some electron micrographs of that uh, in such a way that your absorptive surface is ablated. You have no absorptive surface, so stuff just goes right through you. Invading the mucosa, Things like Shigella and amoebiasis that actually invade the mucosa. And then systemic infection, such as uh, typhoid fever. Among the toxins, I should also mention cytotoxins of C. diff uh, and other things that we'll talk about later. And uh, this looks at some examples of toxins. Preformed toxins, these are syndromes of food poisoning. Various enterotoxins, enterotoxigenic E. coli and Vibrio cholera. And what does a cholera toxin do? It turns on the adenyl cyclase system, right? So that you uh, secrete lots of stuff. And it turns out that toxigenic E. coli does the same thing. As I recall, it stimulates cyclic GMP rather than cyclic AMP. And then various cytotoxins uh, that C. diff, uh, Shigella, and the sugar toxin from E. coli 0157H7, which recently got in spinach, of all things, right? Enteroadherence, things that just stick on the, uh, the, 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 the gut. We've mentioned cryptosporidia and giardiasis. Worms can do that. And then... E. coli, there are lot, about six or seven different syndromes of ways in which different E. coli strains can cause diarrhea, and some of them can stick on enteroadherence. This shows enteropathogenic E. coli, showing how these bugs literally fuse with the mucosa, 
And along the way, the microvilli fall off, destroy the microvilli and stick on to the uh, mucosal surface. An invasion, uh, some things cause very little invasion at all. Viral diarrhea causes very minimal invasion. Variable invasion, salmonella, et cetera. Severe invasion, amoebiasis, which we're not going to talk about much in this lecture. It comes in the parasite le lecture, but remember the... Uh, the flask-shaped ulcers of amoebiasis. In some places, you will read that amoebiasis causes fecal leukocytes, but uh, that's probably not true. You don't really see intact leukocytes in the uh, stool in amoebiasis. Although there may, of course, be leukocytes in the bottom of these ulcers. Interinvasive E. coli, and such as E. coli 0157 and Shigella, these invade the uh, mucosa and so are very, very bad. And then things that use the gut as a portal of systemic infection, there are many, many things that do that, and we're not really going to talk about those in, in this lecture, but just kind of remember that, that you can ingest things. And what might you ingest that get, give you listeriosis? Excuse me? Milk? Milk, ice cream, dairy products, bad cheese. But the major uh, syndromes that we're going to talk about are, uh, look at diarrhea. And again, this amplifies on what we were going over earlier about the runs and the squirts. Three major syndromes of enteric infection. Non-inflammatory, caused by enterotoxins, proximal small bowel, Watery diarrhea, the runs, no fecal leukocytes, number one. That's the runs. Number two is the squirts, inflammatory, invasion, possibly a cytotoxin in some cases, colon, dysentery, fecal leukocytes present. And the third syndrome is penetrating, distal small bowel, enteric fever syndrome, fecal mononuclear sites. What would be the prototype for the penetrating diarrhea, the syndrome here? Anybody? Uh, that's a good idea, uh, and actually, uh, amoebiasis you can get the lesions around the ileocecal valve, uh, and it, as you know, it goes to the liver. Not quite what I was thinking. It used to be a major cause of morbidity and mortality in the United States, and still is in lots of different places. the great triumph of sanitation and plumbing in this country and other civilized countries, or developed countries, as you would say. Not sure how civilized we are. Typhoid. Typhoid fever. And remember from your histology, you get the ulcerations where in the small bowel? Excuse me? Whose patches? Sure, pyrus patches. You see these ulcerations of pyrus patches, and they can be so ulcerated that they perforate. But penetrating diarrhea, typhoid fever. So we look at non-inflammatory toxin diarrhea, cholera, toxigenic E. coli, food poisoning syndromes, in which the onset will be very short, right? Parasites. We mentioned Giardia and Cryptosporidia. Inflammatory, non-inflammatory diarrhea. Neonates, little tiny children, enteropathogenic E. coli, and rotaviruses. Rotaviruses are big. Rotaviruses. Little children, old people in nursing homes. Healthy adults in temperate climates, viruses, food poisoning, sometimes parasites. Traveler's diarrhea can be due to lots of things, often more than one pathogen, but the, the, uh, the prototype is enterotoxigenic E. coli. Adults in areas of poor tox, uh, sanitation, cholera comes in. In the hospital environment, we'll see Clostridium diff, difficile is now the premier pathogen. Sometimes viruses, including rotaviruses, and sometimes the uh, cafeteria, food in the hospital, can be the vector for uh, salmonella. <clears throat> 
And then chronic cases of diarrhea, you think of giardiasis particularly will cause a chronic diarrhea, uh, sprue. And the enteric toxins, we talk about neurotoxins, botulism, be serious, we'll talk about botulism in an emergency lecture. Enterotoxins, direct effect on intestinal mucosa to elicit secretions. Cytotoxins, mucosal destruction causing inflammatory colitis, Shigella 0157. So I've, I've told you a bunch of things in slightly different ways here. Any questions so far if I'm going too fast? Inflammatory diarrhea, again, colon, dysentery, fecal leukocytes, and these are some of the examples. So diarrhea, what I've been trying to get you to do is to think in terms of the syndrome that it might be. Think in terms of the syndrome. An enteric fever, systemic febrile disease from distal small bowel, some combination is seen here of fever, headache, rash, things that direct your attention away from the gut, you have to have positive blood cultures, fecal mononuclear leukocytes, and a broad differential comes into play here. Typhoid, uracinosis, possibly uh, Campylobacter fetus. And now the rest of the lecture, we're going to talk about specific pathogens and hone in on the questions that we'll talk about. And one thing to know about, and, and mark this well for your exam, are the different syndromes of salmonella. Salmonella. Four basic syndromes that can cause gastroenteritis, and there are thousands of cases each year in this country, and a major hazard of salmonella uh, relates to uh, eating out in fast food restaurants, right? I've been hired as a lawyer by the, I mean, as a witness by the defense in a number of salmonella cases. Uh, in which it was alleged that somebody got it from this or that fast food restaurant. Uh, and in my opinion, it ought to be accepted as a, as a fact in common law that if you eat out in a fast food restaurant, you're taking a risk of salmonella. Just a fact. Common knowledge. Enteric fever from salmonella typhi. Bacteremia with or without metastatic disease. In the course of gastroenteritis, you can get salmonella in your blood. Usually it will just whistle through your uh, system of macrophages and spleen and elsewhere will take care of it. Some people have a hard time handling it. Uh, famously, people with sickle cell disease and actually other diseases in which you have hemolysis and iron overload blockading the RE system will uh, will predispose to salmonella, and we talked about in the skin, bone, and joint session about how salmonella osteomyelitis occurs in people with sickle cell disease, because if they get salmonella in their blood, they may be having simultaneously areas of microinfarction in their bone, which then can serve as a place of least resistance, the locus minoris resistentiae for salmonella infection. Another syndrome that's important to know about, and you may be examined about this, is that salmonella can have a tropism for atherosclerotic plaques. And so it can cause a mycotic aneurysm of the aorta. Mycotic, the word is applied to certain aneurysms. Mycotic is a, is a misleading word because it suggests it's fungal, right? But it's actually used in that sense just to denote an infection, an infectious aneurysm. So, if you're over 50 years old and you get salmonella gastroenteritis, salmonella can get into your bloodstream, whereas it would, and one of you just go right through, it can settle out in an in a atherosclerotic plaque in your aorta and you'll blow out an aneurysm. And then some people have an asymptomatic carrier state. In medical history, typhoid Mary, who went from place to place, uh, causing typhoid wherever she went, is a famous example. What, what organ... Uh, Harbor salmonella, especially the reservoir, the gallbladder. <clears throat> typhoid fever has a rash that, uh, be truthful, I have never seen. Typhoid fever is rare, called a rose spot, little tiny spots on the abdomen, typically. Non typhoidal salmonella, widely distributed in nature, contaminates half of the chickens in the United States, unpasteurized milk. Reptiles, especially, 
it's a hazard. You know, people who get, get uh, uh, remedies made out of rattlesnakes from Mexico for their cancers or whatever might get salmonella. People who buy pet, pet turtles get salmonella. Unpasteurized milk. So salmonella is widespread in the environment. And as I mentioned to you, uh, the, the standard dogma is it takes a lot of salmonella to cause disease. You can reduce the inoculum by raising the gastric pH. In recent studies, it's been suggested that maybe fewer organisms than we've conventionally thought may be necessary to cause disease from salmonella. Bacteremia and salmonellosis, to reemphasize the point that I've just made, is usually transient. Nothing happens. Sickle cell disease, famously associated with osteomyelitis, atherosclerotic heart disease, mycotic aneurysm, rarely, very rarely, endocarditis or meningitis might result from bacteremia. And the carrier state from salmonella, about 3% of all cases. You worry about food handlers. In my opinion, they used to do check the stool for salmonella and people who work for fast food restaurants. Now that's not done so much because you know, how often are you going to culture their stools? But it, uh, Hardee's or McDonald's, they might hire somebody who is a, a salmonella carrier, high association with disease of the biliary tract and gallstones, salmonella carrier state. Shigella, we've mentioned again, mark this well, very communicable, very low inoculum required to cause disease, worldwide, extremely important. We see it here in Columbia, see it in nurseries, not too commonly, but we do see it. Uh, there are several strains of, of Shigella, as you remember, Shigella dysenteriae, Shigella shigai, Shigella flexneri, et cetera. Shigella sonii, I think, is the fourth major one, uh, of which the Shiga bacillus type 1 is the most, it's the worst. And the Shiga toxin, and remember, this comes into play probably more importantly for us in that uh, you see it with some of these E. coli strains, 015787, 7, can cause disseminated intravascular coagulation in the hemolytic uremic syndrome, which, as the name implies, affects both the kidneys with uremia and the blood causing hemolysis. Maybe a biphasic illness, interestingly enough, the history could throw you off. You may start off looking like the runs and then wind up with the squirts. Shigellosis. Lots of different types of E. coli diarrhea. That's the main point to remember. And probably the one that will be the sexy one that will be examined, you'll be examined on and boards et cetera, et cetera, will be the 015787 bloody diarrhea with the sugar toxin, sometimes with the hemolytic uremic syndrome, E. coli diarrhea. Hamburgers, in this case, remember the spinach, et cetera, et cetera. And the sugar toxin, E. coli, usually beef, many other fluids, a low infectious dose with this. Doesn't take very many. So wash that spinach well and cook it well which is too bad because the spinach salad is really good, right? A little bit of bacon on it and so on. You like spinach salad? Crampy abdominal pain, again, hemolytic uremic syndrome, sometimes in thrombotic thrombocytopenic purpura. Clostridium difficile. Uh, the antibiotic clindamycin was introduced in the 1970s and became very rapidly the uh, premier antibiotic for anaerobic infections. And it was found that uh, some people were getting this colitis. And for a, a quite a while, there was a huge controversy about what caused uh, colitis from clindamycin. Investigators all over the United States uh, pursued this very aggressively. Uh, it was a, a, a great regional difference. In some places, up to 10% of people who got clindamycin developed diarrhea, often with colitis. In other case, places, it was more like one in 100 
It was found by Bartlett and his group that uh, in 1975 that uh, this was caused by an organism, Clostridium difficile, a previously unrecognized strain of Clostridium that in a, in a hamster model produced a toxin that would then cause diarrhea. And at least, it has at least two toxins, A and B. There's a third toxin now of unclear significance. And it causes a characteristic, uh, it's, it's the most common cause now we recognize of antibiotic-related diarrhea. It can be recognized. It causes a, uh, a colitis with yellow-white plaques that can progress to a diffuse colitis with something called toxic megacolon, where the colon gets very large, a lot of systemic toxicity in the colon can perforate and you can die. And this organism is of great concern in hospital medicine now because it can be transmitted around the hospital. Uh, and it turns out that in this case, it's been well shown that scrupulous attention to hand hygiene with hand washing and the use of uh, disposable rubber gloves between patients uh, is quite preventive. Uh, the thing about C. diff, uh, colonization rate, 2 to 3 percent in healthy adults, 20 to 40 percent in hospitalized patients. This slide is probably not on your computer, is that correct? It's not on it? That's because I, I added this slide and two others last night. <laughs> Excuse me? It's in the new version? Yeah, it'll be on that one. So, uh, based on an article that came out last week, was uh, I decided to update the slide. Widespread contamination of hospital environments, hand washing, including gloves, has been shown to reduce infection rates. So note that point and this point uh, real closely. And this is a picture looking with the colonoscope, slightly out of focus probably, but uh, the point is these, that everything should be pink there, these whitish plaques which are loaded with uh, polymorphic nuclear leukocytes. C. diff, of course, is the clostridium. It's a gram-positive bacillus. This is a case of toxic megacolon, uh, showing this uh, colon, instead of being nicely pink throughout, is hemorrhagic throughout, again, with these plaques on it, these yellowish plaques, a lot of hemorrhage, and the entire colon had to be removed. Uh, there is now, in the past five years, there's a new epidemic strain of, of uh, C. diff that we've not yet seen in Columbia. We had a, a person who was transferred from an uh, extended care facility, got C. diff in the hospital and died of toxic megacolon in Richland, and we were concerned it might be our first case of this. We had not yet seen it here, but there have been outbreaks in the United States of a, of a new strain of C. diff that's a lot more serious with a mortality rate attributable to the infection of 17 percent versus 1 percent for other strains with treatment. More serious and refractory with increasing rates of toxic megacolon, disease requiring colectomy, shock and death, and this has been given a name, don't memorize stuff like this, but, uh, called B1NAP1. It's been given a name. So there's a new strain out there. So this could be for you, like methicillin resistant staff uh, producing the Panton valentine leukocidin factor. This could be a pathogen that you'll deal with the rest of your professional life. And this is another new slide uh, that I'm not going to examine you on, but it produces much larger quantities of toxin A and B. And uh, just to kind of uh, show you how the, this molecular stuff that you've uh, been reading about will be important for keeping up with the literature. Looking at the genome, it's shown that it's, you, can, you can actually type the toxin that's produced. This strain is of a particular toxinotype, and it shows from its genome a deletion of a little bit of a base pair sequence in the pathogenicity locus that's responsible for downregulating the amount of toxin that's produced. So that, again, correlates genetics with uh, what we're seeing clinically. It also produces a binary toxin, and it's resistant to quinolone antibiotics. And so what's been found in Canada and elsewhere is that some of the newer quinolone-type antibiotics are tending to uh, promote the appearance of this. <clears throat> Any questions about C. diff? Campylobacter, Campylobacter uh, fetus, subspecies jejuni, is a fairly important cause of diarrhea. 
usually self-limited, cramps, anorexia, weight loss. You may see blood. So this could mimic sort of overlaps in my mind both salmonella and shigella. Tends to be sort of milder like salmonella. Blood in 60%, poly is in 78% like uh, shigella. Yersinia is one that you don't see very much in this country, but uh, will uh, is apt to show up on exams, particularly for the syndrome of uh, pseudoappendicitis, mesenteric adenitis and terminal ileitis with fever, right lower quadrant pain, and leukocytosis. So people will be will be taken to surgery for suspected appendicitis and found to have a normal appendix with, a, with some uh, big swollen mesenteric lymph nodes. It can also cause, we talked about reactive arthritis. A lot of reactive arthritis can occur with Yersinia as well. Can cause sepsis, can cause enterocolitis in younger people. So just remember you saw Yersinia and remember that uh, pseudo uh, appendicitis type of syndrome. There, there are actually two Yersinia species of medical importance, enterocolitica and pseudotuberculosis. The latter is more famously associated strictly with the mesenteric adenitis. If I were in your shoes, I wouldn't clutter my mind with those. I would just remember Yersinia generically there and not clutter my mind with the two types. But remember that Yersinia can cause mesenteric adenitis Vibrio, para, there are two vibrios of importance uh, of lots of, well, of course, cholera is a vibrio too. What's a vibrio? It's a little gram-negative, comma-shaped bacterium. Besides vibrio cholera, parahemolyticus and volnificus both associated with shellfish and seafood. This is often epidemics here. You might get this after a, a see an epidemic after a crawfish boil, for example. Diarrhea, cramps, fever, headache, may have thicker leukocytes. So vibrios, think of shellfish, vibrio parahemolyticus, and vibrio volnificus, usually an extraintestinal pathogen, that is, diarrhea is not that important thing. And remember for exams and life that people with raw oysters, I'm sorry, people with cirrhosis should not eat raw oysters because of the risk of septicemia. And we talked about Vibrio volnificus causing a bad cellulitis. Cholera, the O1 serotype is a really bad one, watery diarrhea. Non-O1s, less severe, can have blood in the stool with these actually, often with traveler's diarrhea. This is the one that famously turns on the adenyl cyclase system. And then in the cellulitis lecture or the skin infection lecture, we talked about Eremonus hydrophila. Hydrophila suggesting water, right? Fresh water. This pathogen can also cause diarrhea in the summer months. In parasitic diarrheas, amoebiasis affects uh, is a common pathogen worldwide and often seen in the United States. The flask-shaped ulcers that we talked about here, like an Erlenmeyer flask. Liver abscesses goes from the ileocecal region up to the liver, usually in the right lobe of the liver. And these are the areas that it tends to infect around the ileocecal valve and then in the rectus sigmoid area. And this shows amoebae with ingested red blood cells. And these can be mistaken for polymorph nuclear leukocytes in stool. And this shows a cyst. There's another amoeba species. It looks 
identical to this. In Geordiuk, we talked about camping in the Rocky Mountains. I should change that, shouldn't I, to St. Petersburg. It can cause diarrhea by several mechanisms and a chronic diarrhea with weight loss, diarrhea, you know, unpleasant to be around. Geodiasis. This is uh, looking sideways, the tropes of Giardia. And here are the cysts of Giardia. Let's do let me see. Cryptosporidia causes how many of you grew up on a farm? Anybody? You did? Grew up on a farm? So what are scours? <laughs> Scours, we didn't ask her what kind of farm, a diarrhea and a calf. So it's called the scours. Affects numerous animals, but really we began to recognize this with the HIV AIDS epidemic. In healthy adults, it causes a self limited diarrhea, but in AIDS patients, diarrhea lasting an average of five months with a high mortality rate. And these are the cryptosporidia, and this shows uh, how this organism just sits, infuses to the basement membrane of the gut with the villi dropping out. So you can see how this would just massively parasitize the gut. And early on in the AIDS epidemic, the tragedy that I saw again and again was people, and I'd visit them in their homes, uh, with diarrhea who were too weak to get up to go to the bathroom. Lots of animal species infected with it. Uh, you can get it in the community. And it got into the water supply in Milwaukee on one occasion and infected 400,000 people. We'll close with just a word or two about viral diarrhea, rotaviruses, sporadic epidemics in institutions, infants and young children, fecal oral, the DNA virus, which is an ELISA test for it, and Norwalk, typically epidemic. You might get this on a cruise ship or something, often tied to a common source throughout the year, usually older folks, adults and older children. And we're going to skip traveler's diarrhea. Uh, Montezuma's Revenge, the Aztec two-step, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just to remind you uh, about uh, lots of different pathogens, especially in a, in a toxigenic uh, E. coli. Any questions? <laughs>